Okay, friends. Um, so this is our jobs in the theater lecture. Um, and it is based on chapter one of our book, Illustrated Theater Production Guide. Uh, I will also diverge from that a little bit and give you sort of a broader perspective about production structure than is in the book because the book is like, here's some big ideas. And then they're like, here's how to be a follow spot operator, which to me is not what this segment should be about. Um, so this is really about the first, I don't know, third or half of that jobs in the theater chapter in our book. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So there are um, four different structures for theatrical production that I think of when I think about producing theater. Um, the first one is the obvious commercial theater, which is Broadway shows. There's regional theater, Lort theaters, there, which is the League of Regional Theaters. Um, there's a union designation with the Actors' Equity Union. Um, so regional theaters are smaller theaters out in the various states. That's where um, a lot of Broadway shows will try out before they end up on Broadway. Academic theater, which is theater that's as part of an academic program and has that educational function. Um, and then storefront theater, which is your small professional theater in the LA area. It's usually 99 seat theater. That's usually how it's described. Um, and then community theater, right? Which is kind of by and for the people um, who make it. So let's do a little bit like in depth about each of these theater types. Okay, commercial theater, this is Broadway, right? So producers are doing one show at a time. Their goal is to make money. Um, and that, that money is made on Broadway initially, and then ultimately through a national or international tour franchise. Um, and then even further down the pike, they might make money um, in the back end, right? So once a show is a big success on Broadway, they're gonna make money on Broadway, they're gonna make money on every subsequent production of that show that goes on tour. And then they're also going to get a piece of the rights or royalties that are paid out each time another theater company does that show, right? So they, they generally, as part of their contract, are getting a little bit of the back end all the way down. But it's a big gamble because is the show going to make it on Broadway is, is a lot of investment money in order to, to get to that spot. Um, your production staff on those Broadway shows will generally work on an IATC. Um, union contract and they have different variations of this union contract across the country. Um, Local One is the IATC union house in New York City. Um, in LA we have a theatrical stagehands union branch so this is literally for people who work on stage. Um, that's Local 33. We also have a bunch of other IATC union branches that cover the various crafts in the film industry. So there are many union members, stagehand union members, um, who are not necessarily working on theatrical production, theatrical shows, right? Um, the stagehands union, and I'll talk a little bit about this at the end, but in addition to covering uh, Broadway show type production. They also cover conventions and various convention centers and arenas across the country. So they're providing that stage labor um, at that high level of uh, expertise. Um, and it's important, right, to a producer that they have that across the country on a regional tour. So then we have regional theater. So this is sort of, um, I mean, it took off in the middle of the century, right? Mid century. Uh, la the last one, the last century, so it's like 50s, 60s, 70s, um, and there were companies, it would really be 60s and 70s, right, because in the 50s you had McCarthyism and that kind of cut off everything. Um, history, so in the 60s and 70s you had theater companies that were built around the country with the goal of producing high quality professional theater in local communities, right? So they would, in order to establish this, they would um, hire a resident company of full-time contracted actors and designers and production staff. Those then became a national circuit, okay? So this was a way that people who were professional actors and, and designers and technicians could have that stable uh, full-time gig, right? And also live in an American community that wasn't New York 
and wasn't about that constant turning um, that New York was. So each organization, each of these regional theaters, produces a season of shows that are supported by and presented for their local audiences. And some of these productions are the tryouts or development projects that are hoping to become a Broadway show. Regional theater has changed a lot in the last 30 years. Um, it's gone from this model, right, this resident company model, where people all had full-time jobs, to really an extension of the freelance artist world, where yes, there are some roles, typically administrative roles, that are full-time positions, but where there used to be a resident scenic designer, there really is not any longer. And that has a lot to do with a couple of things. One of them was the way that artistic directors need to change the makeup of the production schedule in order to manage budgets in different ways. So in that case, once you get you know into the 90s and 2000s, you really are in a situation where artistic directors first of all, need to reflect diversity in the population and in the productions that they do. And so a lot of them were sitting on these acting companies, which are 12, you know, white people. And that wasn't an effective model for them. Um, and then the other thing that was going on in addition to that was they would be bringing in, rather than that artistic director directing all of the shows, they bring in an outside director that director has a design team that they've worked with before that they'd like to work with again. Um, and so you have artistic directors sort of assembling a team for a specific project as opposed to hiring a staff that does five shows or seven shows in a year. Um, and so that's sort of the big shift in regional theater. Now it really is contract based um, for everyone in production, whereas it used to be much more of a, of a seasonal product. Um, so that's regional theater. Academic theater, that's you, it you. Um, academic theater is under the product producing model of a school, right? So a lot of the time they're using a variation or modeled on a variation of the regional theater production process, um, but they instead of having artistic directors and a board that act as leadership, they have a full-time faculty um, of that institution who act as the leadership component of that producing program. Um, the academic program will produce a season of shows um, and most of the time they have a considerations, they have considerations of opportunities for the audience um, of that university or other academic institution um, and then also the students who are participating in that production. So frequently um, the season selection team will consider who are the actors who are graduating this year who we want to make sure have featured roles in our productions, for example, or what is the population that our department is serving and how can we choose productions that support them. Uh, the same is true with design opportunities on academic projects where you will have the design team um, the design faculty will be like, here are the up and coming designers, here are the kinds of projects we think would be a good fit for them. So they'll push for shows that create those opportunities for their students as well. Um, the roles for students oppor offer opportunities for growth and learning in an environment without the pressures of financial success. Um, and that is important, right? Like you're not generally in any academic situation there's no meaningful portion of the budget which is made up by ticket sales, typically. Um, typically there is some small slice of your budget that will be coming from your ticket sales, but for the most part, it's about learning things and trying things and creating an opportunity within a safe space to fail. And I think that's a super important um, thing to remember when we're producing academic theater and that it's critical for us to keep in mind that it's not a tragedy if we make a mistake here or it doesn't come off perfectly because we all were learning something and that's the higher goal in an academic producing model. So then we have storefront theater or 99 seat theater, um, so called in Los Angeles because the actor's equity contract 
uh, allows 99 seats on their limited contract in order to allow uh, talent to perform. So in storefront theater, we're talking about small scale productions, right, in less equipped spaces and with limited production staff. Typically your designers don't have technicians supporting them the way that they would in regional theater. You have professional artists working on these smaller productions, both to develop new plays, to create experimental artistic work, um, to do the kinds of things that they are interested in doing, and also to practice their craft. That's very true in the performing community here in LA because a lot of the actors who work in 99 seat theater are honing their craft while they're auditioning for commercial or television film roles. Um, and so it is, a, it is a lab space for acting as well as for directing and design where you're working with a smaller budget and then not, um, where you're working with a smaller budget and leveraging that to create an artistic product. Some storefront producing companies do do a full season of shows, so they might do, you know, six or seven shows in a year. Others will put together a production only when that specific director or producer has a project that they want to do. Um, and to me, that's something that's a really valuable thing to remember, which is that you don't have to start a theater company to do a show that you're excited about. Um, and that's something that a lot of like storefront theater people are like, I need to make my theater company so I can do a play. No, you don't have to. You can just produce your play that you're excited about um, and, let, and let it not be about whatever bigger idea. Um, okay, so then last we have community theater. This is all my community and educational theater major types. Um, community theater is productions uh, that are for and driven by passionate community members and their love of this art form. I um, have a lot of experience managing, a th I managed a theater space in Kentucky that served a bunch of different community theater organizations. Um, those productions are sometimes characterized as amateur, but to me, a more valuable way of describing them is like avocational. Like this is not, the people who are working on those shows don't deserve the label of amateur, um, in my opinion. And I think that there's tremendous value in the way that that work is created and also the opportunities that it provides both to the people who are involved in it um, for artistic expression and fulfillment and connection um, and community and also for those audiences of the other members of that organization or the other members of that group who would come and see and participate in that live performance event. Um, the artistic team on a community theater production is typically not paid uh, I call this after school activities for grownups. So this is like the after work softball team of theater. People are there because they love it and not to make a living. And that I think is still a really valuable thing. Um, I do want to do a quick sort of diversion into amateur versus avocational. So amateur is defined as a person who engages in a pursuit, especially a sport in an unpaid rather than a professional basis, or a person who is incompetent or inept at a particular activity. And that's the one that really gets me. I, I find that to be really unhelpful in characterizing theatrical work. Um, and so as an alternative to that language, I like the word avocational which is an activity that someone engages in as a hobby outside of their main occupation. So it may not be how they pay the bills, but it is a true and deep um, investment for them. And I think there are many examples of people whose professions were the way they made their living, but for whom activities outside of their workplace were their true passions in life. Um, and to me, that is equally valid as a, an approach to theater making. Okay, so that's types of theater production, theater producing models. Let's talk a little bit about our artistic team, and then we'll talk about the individual production departments within theatrical production, okay? So the artistic team is the originators, the, crea the creators, of a theatrical piece. So that would include your playwright, your director, your designers for scenery, lighting, hair, 
sound, makeup, video, projection, your, your choreographers who are coordinating movement, um, and then actors, of course, and other performers who are involved in that theatrical piece. And that's sort of within the crucible of that piece. And then you have artisans, okay? Um, and that is people who are using a creative approach to craft objects for everyday life is your definition there, right? Um, so those people in theatrical production world, and these are, these are a lot of what we talked about when we talked about um, shop class as soul craft, right? These are people who have tremendous skill in a specific area um, of technical production. So you have carpenters building things, you have electricians, um, and this is specifically stage electricians, not the people who rewire your house. I would not trust a lot of stage le electricians to re rewire my house, but um, they're great on a stage. Uh, stage hands, so people who move scenery during a show um, and otherwise support production. Painters, specifically scenic painters, audio engineers, stage managers, prop makers, stitchers, and costumers, um, that, and that would also include, you know, all of your wardrobe staff for production. Um, and there are more areas, but those are artisans who are using their specific craft to create parts of this production. Um, okay, so let's talk about production organization, okay? So when we look at, this is a, this is a typical structure um, that is the model for a lot of regional theaters and a lot of college theater departments, okay? And that's where we have kind of, there are people who are part of a full-time staff and there are people who are attached to individual shows. So when you look at your theater department as a whole, you have the, the director of the play who is attached to the particular show. That person um, is working directly with their design team um, who is working with assistants and props, painters, shoppers, right? All of those other artisans that work with the designers. Then you have your production stage manager as sort of an administrator um, and this is also often your production manager, so it's not always called a production stage manager. Um, it's often the production manager. Uh, and that person is managing full-time staff of the theater or of the theater space or of the department. So that's your technical director, your costume shop supervisor, your master electrician. Um, you might have a sound shop head or a video shop head. Um, so those are all people who work for the theater um, and they are executing all of the plans developed by this team for an individual show, okay? Um, under each of these people are specific artisans that are part of their staff and you have a stage manager kind of in the middle of all of this uh, translating and transferring information, acting as a conduit between what's happening in this part of the diagram. So this is what's happening in the rehearsal room and to some extent what's happening with the designers and all of these technical people who are executing those goals um, in order to pull it together, right, into a production. So that's a, an example of production organization. I would hit pause and take a minute and like map it out. We'll also, do um, an exercise mapping out production organization at Cal Poly when we meet on Monday. So that's something we're going to do together. So now let's talk about more detail on these individual roles, okay? Um, and then you can refer back to this or in the book where it talks about this. This diagram is straight out of the book. So you have an artistic director. This is the CEO. Um, they are the head of the theater. They um, are called the artistic director to distinguish the position from a director of an individual show, right? So they're not directing every show, but they're acting as the artistic director of the entire staff. Um, they, in a, in a regional theater model, that person is choosing or is the final word on production choice, right? Season planning. 
um, and they also oversee artistic decision making. So if you get into a situation where there's a disagreement within the design team or there's a big issue, the artistic director has the authority to step in and make a decision um, about how things work. Usually they don't want to. Usually they would like to work in partnership with a director that they've hired for a show because hopefully they had a reason. Um, but this is a way, right, that that can be remedied if it has to be. In academic theater, you might have a department chair who's in a parallel position to that uh, artistic director, or you may have a faculty committee. So the full-time faculty may meet as a committee to make those artistic decisions jointly. And it really just depends on the academic structure within your specific department. In a regional theater, um, you'll also typically have a managing director or an executive director, and that person is the leader of an administrative department, which we're going to talk about not very much. <laughs> um, so they tend to be the person who manages all of the financial side of things, from fundraising to um, budgets and contracts and legal requirements. They take care of a lot of those logistics with for the artistic director in order to execute production. Um, so this person is in many ways sort of an executive producer, right? Um, they're overseeing practical decision making, including budgeting, contracting artists, front of house, marketing, outreach, and fundraising. Um, and so typically they, they head up an administrative team, which we aren't going to cover as much in this particular tour of how does theater work. Um, but they also are kind of the boss of most of the staff um, on a logistical side. So artistic director vision, managing director logistical execution. Then you'll have a production manager and that person is in that chain, uh, the supervisor of all of the production staff and the project manager for individual shows. They'll hire the technical department heads those people will work for the production manager. They oversee the overall production budget um, as well as individual budgets on various projects. And they also schedule the meetings and the deadlines for production as well as spaces and shop time. Um, so this person is really a overarching project manager for the theatrical company um, and super, super important in terms of prioritizing um, facilitating and uh, hopefully finding ways of allocating budgetary opportunity, you know, allocating budget to create the goals of allocating budget to meet the goals of the artistic director. So that's your production manager. Now let's talk about individual departments um, that are falling underneath your production manager. So we have the scenic department. Um, so in our design team, that's the scenic designer. They're working with the scenic production department. Um, the head of that scenic department is typically your technical director. The technical director oversees the shop where the scenery is built. They also can schedule and budget specific scenic production elements. And then any design drafting that comes into the shop, the technical director will create the detailed construction drawings to execute that drafting. Um, the technical director is typically the one who is responsible for engineering. So I, as a scenic designer, I don't have um, a degree in structural engineering. That's not my gig. Um, and so the technical director will take responsibility for, here's my artistic design idea. This is what I want it to look like you figure out how to build it so it's safe for everyone who's going to be working on this project. Um, and so that's the technical director's job. Um, people who work under the technical director in the scene shop are your shop foreman, your master carpenter, shop carpenters and welders. Those are all artisans um, and they, they have various roles depending on the specific organization of that production. There are also two different carpenter roles um, to consider and keep track of when we're talking about theatrical production. So we have a shop carpenter who works in the scene shop and builds the scenic units. And so that person needs to be able to look at a plan, start from scratch and build the 
the pieces that are drawn, okay? Then you have a stage carpenter um, who works in the scenic department as a stagehand, um, but is not necessarily the person in the shop building things. And this becomes more true when you talk about Broadway theaters, regional, th like higher level regional theaters, um, and any kind of tour, right? You still have a carpentry department, but their, their role is less building things from scratch and more execution of um, production in place, right? On the stage itself. So a stage carpenter works to load in, so that's bringing everything in at the beginning and setting up your scenery when it arrives at the theater, running shows during performances, um, basic maintenance, and then loading out that scenery at the end of the run, um, falling under that category of stage carpenters. So these are all people who work in the scenic department during the run of a show. Are your stage hands a flyman, which I guess a fly person would be a better term to use, or a deck carpenter, deck, deck referring to the stage itself. So a deck carpenter is, the, is a carpenter who's working on the stage as opposed to in the fly loft or elsewhere in the theatrical space. There's no water. Okay, so then we have props, which is its own sub department. So a props master is sometimes a design role and sometimes not. Sometimes they're designated um, within the production departments, and sometimes it's more of um, an assistant to the set designer. But in our regional theater role division, the props master is a part of the scenic department. Um, and they have this role, which is both uh, artistic in terms of finding and executing props and set dressing, um, but also just logistical as all hell, because you have so many requests and requirements of these specific objects that are dictated both by the design concept and also by the use factor of what the actor needs it to do, what they need it to do from the rehearsal room. So that's a role that really spans a lot of different areas. Um, so they work with the scenic designer, stage manager, and the director, and often the actors as well, to find or borrow or rent or build all of the props required for the show, often including set dressing and furniture in addition to hand props. And when we talk about props, we'll talk more about what those distinctions are. Um, and then we have a scenic charge artist, and that is the person who will lead our paint crew. So they execute paint elevations, which are specific drawings that are provided by the scenic designer. Um, basically, a great scenic artist can take a picture and figure out how to make it full stage size using paint. Um, they're amazing people. I love them. They're fantastic. Very, very cool. Um, so that's the scenic department. Let's head into lighting. Okay, so in the lighting department, fewer individual roles. So um, we do still break it down, though, into a bunch of different jobs, right? But a lot of these in smaller productions are fulfilled by the same person. So you'll have a master electrician who is the head of the electrics shop. They ensure the execution of the lighting design, manage it and maintain lighting inventory and schedule the lighting calls, right? Um, the master electrician will also be responsible um, in like a regional theater situation or a roadshow situation for executing the bid and rental package for a show. So if they don't have all of the equipment that they need in house, the master electrician is the one who's responsible for bidding out the rental package, sourcing all of the equipment that the designer has specified, um, and also any expendables, purchasing those, preparing them, okay? Then you have stage electricians. Um, if we were in person, this would be you. Um, and they are the people who come in and load in and set up the lighting system specific to the show. They read the light plot, they install and focus fixtures under the supervision of the Emmy and the lighting designer. So then we have some roles that are more specific to once we're in production, okay? So the stage electricians are the people who are doing this all in preparation for the tech process and production process um, and run of show. Once we get into tech, um, you have a deck electrician 
who maintains and runs the, the lighting on stage during the performance. They're also often the person who will be responsible for like changing out a lamp that dies during the middle of a run. We have a programmer or a board op. Um, so this person will program the light board during tech rehearsals, they'll run lighting cues during the show. Um, they tend to have this kind of amazing technical wizard mind where they like are very into making macros to do boring things. Um, usually making the macro takes longer than whatever task they're trying to simplify, but like that's their jam. So go at it guys. I'm all about this life. Um, I don't want to do it, but if you do, you're my best friend. Sure, go for it, thank you. Um, and then we have follow spot operators who are so cool, oh my gosh. So um, they run a follow spot during the show, they track performances live, um, the performers live throughout the performance. Um, the really good ones working on road houses are magicians with a follow spot. Um, it's like an extension of their body and they can anticipate people as they're coming on stage. They never miss a pickup even if they've maybe never seen the show, right? They maybe never saw it for a rehearsal, but they don't miss a beat. They're just amazing. Um, very cool. Lots of upper body strength. The follow spot is heavy. Um, so if you want to get into follow spot operation, get your muscles going, okay? Um, okay, sound department. So the sound department, again, we're sort of getting into fewer individuals involved. You'll have a head audio engineer. This is an analog to your master electrician. They head up the audio shop, ensure the execution of the sound design, um, and that's specifically the physical execution of the sound design. So that's where do the speakers go? How are they connected? Does everything work the way it's supposed to? And then they manage and maintain a speaker and microphone inventory for the house, right? So for that particular space, they maintain all of that equipment. Um, they also will prepare sound equipment packages for individual productions and order or create a rental agreement for any required rental equipment for a show. Um, various sound designers will specify different gear and oftentimes there will be situations in which a production requires do one musical a year for example they're not going to purchase 30 body mics but they would rent those for that period of time your head audio engineer is responsible for that they have to make sure everything works so they like sit in their little closet of an office soldering stuff that's been my experience um you have an a1 uh which is your soundboard operator so they mix live sound for musicals and other performance events. They're standing out in the house. They have to be typically inside of the volume of space where the theater goer is um, in order to be able to hear and mix accurately. So they'll be up at the back of the house typically um, mixing sound for anything from a live production to concerts and other uh, kinds of production events, right, events. Um, and then A2 is a microphone technician. So this person um, is your backstage arm of the sound department. So they will work backstage, they'll manage your body mics for the performers. Um, in some cases, the A2 may also do something like mixing the monitors if you have a band on stage. Um, any sort of live performance music event. You might have an A2 who's mixing the monitors that allow the performers to hear themselves while you have an A1 out in the house who's doing the front of house mix for everyone in the audience. Um, often under the sound department, um, you will find the video engineers. So anyone who's a technician working with a projection designer um, sometimes you don't have that at all, like the projection designer is just on their own, story of my life. Um, but if you're lucky, you have a video engineer. Um, and sometimes it'll fall under the lighting department, sometimes under sound. Um, and it depends on how the um, organization is structured within that specific company. 
Um, it's very helpful for the video department to fall with sound just because the lighting department tends to have a lot of physical notes during tech. There are a lot, there are typically notes that they need to do. Um, and the sound department, hopefully their setup, their rig doesn't change once you get into tech very much. So they, if they uh, manage the video as well, then they typically have a little bit more staff availability to support tech. Um, video, video also often uses, I mean, it's very computer based, which more than the lighting department, sound designers are using the same softwares or similar softwares or more computer based, um, technology. And so for that reason, it makes sense for it to fall within sound. Um, on the other hand, projection is made of light. So I get it if you put it in the lighting department, but you know, anyway, let's move on. Anyways, enough about me. Um, so the video engineer would handle your projectors, live feed cameras, computer interfaces, other software and hardware needs to support a video or a projection design. Um, so that includes an iPad or a TV on stage or um, any number of things that are not a straight projector can still be part of that video department. Then we have the costume department, um, and that is managed by a costume shop manager. That person heads the costume shop, ensures the execution of costume design, manages and maintains costume stock and individual show budgets. You have stitchers who work in the costume shop under that shop manager. Um, and they, they build costumes and complete alterations on stock and rental costumes for this specific show. You'll have wardrobe crew and dressers who work uh, the, during the run of show to maintain costumes, clean them, laundry is a big part of wardrobe, um, and assist with costume changes during performances. Um, yes, maintain costumes and do laundry so the actors don't smell. That's important. Um, and also so that the costumes will hold up over the period of time that the show will run. Um, and then hair and makeup. Uh, often actors will do their own uh, makeup, but sometimes specialized crew support special effects makeup. Um, or they take care of wigs and do wig maintenance. Um, so if a production has a lot of wigs, then it is really valuable to have someone who will manage um, and maintain those wigs over the course of the show. Let's see, we're almost done. All right, so stage management, of course, everybody's boss department. Um, so your stage manager coordinates rehearsals, tracks blocking technical elements, schedules actors and for their rehearsals and for other appointments, like costume fittings, um, fight calls, all of that kind of stuff. And then they distribute information to the production team as a whole through the rehearsal reports. Um, this is super, super important because your, your design team, for example, is not at every rehearsal. And so that stage manager can be such a fantastic conduit of all of the information that's happening um, to keep everyone who's not actually in the room in the loop um, in terms of what things might be changing or what direction stuff might be going in. They also lead our technical rehearsal, call cues for the show, um, and then maintain the performances in the director's absence, including scheduling and running under study rehearsals. So in academic theater, typically your director will like hang around the whole time once you're in a regional theater situation, your director will be there for like the opening weekend and then they go to direct their next show and the show will run for six or eight weeks. Um, or in a, in a Broadway situation, it could run for years. Um, and over that period of time, um, the stage manager is responsible for performances, right? For keeping things from drifting, for keeping that actor who got a laugh from like, really blowing up that one moment when it wasn't the original intention in the scene. Um, and so that stage manager, in addition to all of their technical capacity, also has a really clear view of how the artistic direction of the show is supposed to be. Um, and they have a lot of documentation to support that. 
uh, and that allows them to help maintain performances and keep the show in its locked state when it opened for as long as it runs. Um, and then one little caveat about unions, right? There was a little asterisk earlier, like many slides ago, like 40 minutes of slides ago about unions. Um, so here are some like acronyms and words around unions uh, that you'll see. Um, and these are specific to live performance. You'll also hear things like SAG-AFTRA. That's more of a film performance situation. But we have IATSE, that's the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. I talked about them a little bit. They originated right when uh, Broadway was starting to do shows all over the country and wanted to make sure that they had qualified crew in every city that they would stop in. Um, and so they built up this network of IATSE stagehands um, across the country who have a certain level of qualification and expectation. Um, once you're in that union, then, uh, then you would work on those Broadway shows and also other events, live events all across the country. Um, so that's IATSE. It's broken down into a many, many different locals. Um, not all of them are specific to live production. So there are film based locals within, uh, the IATSE union as well. So you may run into something like Local 44, which is the props union for film production, but that also falls under IATSE. We have AEA, the Actors' Equity Association. Uh, they manage all of the actors, live actor performers, um, and also stage managers fall within under Actors' Equity. This is, um, you can read the contracts. They're very interesting. I mean, I don't know, to me at least. They, they provide a lot of the structure around the workday, right? The union also does, but the actor's equity, I'm sorry, <laughs> the union, it's all the union. Um, IATSE also produ provides a lot of structure, but many times um, actors' equity actors are the only, and, and stage managers are the only unionized workforce on a production. Um, that's true with 99 Seat Theater, where the only union represented really would be Actors' Equity. Then you have LORT, uh, the League of Regional Theaters. That's a contract under Actors' Equity, um, but you'll hear people talking about LORT theaters um, as like a designation for a theater type. Uh, USA is the United Scenic Artists, and that's where many of the design, in fact, like design uh, many of the design areas will fall. Um, if you're a union scenic designer, that's the union that would represent you. Um, the other one is, what is it? SDA, Stage Directors Association. There is a union for directors um, and they do a lot of that work um, in terms of making sure director contracts are what they should be. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else off the top of my head. Those are the main ones. Uh, unions were, are, unions are critical in terms of structuring the work so that you don't get plowed into 16 hour days for no reason. Um, and a lot of places, even if they aren't a union space, will still manage things based on the standards set by the union for like how much time before a break, all of that kind of stuff um, is in your rehearsal process is based on actor, actors equity rules, even if you're not an equity production. Um, and that's probably true for our shows as well. Um, I know I expect to have my breaks based on that union, that actors union schedule when I'm doing shows. All right, that's jobs in the theater. We did it, fantastic. Um, thanks so much. I'll see you in the next lecture video. Bye.